of purpose. So this morning we're going to dig in. So a little bit, a little bit before we get to that, we're going to do something different. Uh, how many of you have a device? And again, I'm not calling you out. I just want to know if you have a smartphone or a a laptop or a uh, what do you call it? Tablet with you? With you? With you? How about a smartphone? Oh, all right, this is gonna be fun. All right. Raise your hands if you have it with you. Raise it high, 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 high. All right, so those, look, keep it up. Keep your hands up high. Keep it up. Watch, okay, everybody look around the room. Look around the room. That, that have it, okay? If you don't have one, here's what we're, we're gonna gather. If you're on this side, if you don't have one, don't stay here. Go someone over there. You guys go over here. And we'll also do at the same time, you can do a meet and greet for a few seconds, not like 20 minutes like we usually do. Let's do a few seconds. We'll do a meet and greet and then sit with someone that has a device and we're gonna take a little quick quiz. Fun quiz, it's not like wrong. And we're gonna have, we're, so today's message is gonna be a little bit more interactive. Interactive. So when you guys are together, those with a smartphone, you're gonna take your smartphone and uh, hopefully, if you have a QR reader or a barcode reader, you can just read that, or if not, just type in that address, and then we'll get started. So go ahead and find somebody that has a smartphone. Let's go, yeah.
so what we'll do is uh, we'll have the media team just post up the questions, and then we'll we'll just do a group, a group discussion, and then I'll point to a certain group, so like group of three or four, and I'll point a second, and you guys just give a couple of things. So uh, media team, if you go ahead and uh, put up the first slide, then. So in your little groups, discuss what the purpose of the Labrador Retriever. Uh, go ahead and do Jeopardy for their time to make. Specifically bred to be with the Roman army, army to herd their their flock and to guard the flock and guard you guys ready guard the army and keep them company. Isn't that neat? So they were to be protectors, and they eventually they started going to the civilian world, and they were used to when the merchants would travel on the road, they would bring their rot Rottweilers to protect and guard them from robbers on the road. Awesome. Next one. Are they going to get harder and harder, by the way? Oh, 
Since the natural had a St. Bernard, they could give us an answer of what the purpose of the St. Bernard was for. Bartenders. Bartenders. Oh. <laughs> what are you talking about the, the barrel that's carried in their hotels? Rescue. 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 What's that? Rescue lost travelers. Rescue lost travelers. Anybody else? A house dog. I told you they're gonna get harder, a little bit harder. They're Brenda Drool. <laughs> that was my dog at home. <laughs> what do you have? Rescue dog. Rescue dog. Rescue dog. Rescue dog. Rescue dog. Yeah. Rescue dog. Is that so? Guys, you like this one? They were actually bred for monks in the 17th century. Monks. Monks. M O N K S. Monks. And you'll love this, uh, they were especially bred just to guard their compound, where the monks were. And here's what's really cool. Of course, we know them to, uh, to find people, right, in the snow, but you know how they got, so the monks also use them, and this is kind of weird how they bred them, they said, we're gonna use them also to help us find lost souls. Purposely and purposefully, purposefully, Created. All right, next one. Music, please. Next dog. Get them out. Yes. I didn't look how cute that 
the Zeus who fled. So they were actually threatened to go get these rats and actually kill them. And they looked like they couldn't hurt a fly, but they do. All right, last one, last one, last one. Ready? So here's their sole purpose of being bred. Nothing but to be a pet. That is it. <laughs> so they were bred just to be a pet. So it, this leads to my introduction. So that was our intro with a little quiz. A little quiz. Um, so you see how even people think of, you know, how do we create a, a dog breed for purpose? So God didn't just create us just to create us because he's God and he has the power to do so. But God created us with a purpose and full of purpose. So we're here today because you know, we're not just dog breeds just for a pet. So God didn't create us just to be a pet. He created us with a purpose. Now think about that. You look in this room how different we are, where we come from. And yet, we come with purpose. So when Jesus in John 17, you guys remember in the series that we're going, he said, I send them too into the world as Father, you sent me into the world. Now listen when he said that. I send them as you sent me. So Jesus was sent with a purpose, right? My friend, we are sent with a purpose as well. We are. Now, many of you would probably think, okay, we're, we're set for a ministry, and we're set with a mission, but I wanna, I wanna share with you that there's, there, there are two different things. There's two different things on that. The ministry that we have, it is for believers, but it is, is when I have a ministry, it is a ministry to serve the body of Christ. That's what a ministry is. We're here to serve the body of Christ. And our mission is, is different. It's not that. It is to serve the unbelievers of the world. Two different things. When we go out and we go to unbelievers or like Africa or whatever, we're saying that's why it's called missionaries and not, and not really ministers. Does that make sense? So when you go out and you're serving, this is what's so cool. When you're serving one another, so... So, Ms. Suzanne, when you go visit Dottie and you take care of her, you're ministering to her. You're not missionary to her. But when you go out and you are you go kayaking and you bump into someone and you start sharing the gospel and loving on them, you have become a missionary. Does that make sense? I think all too often we, we think this. We think that if you're a minister, you must go to Bible college. You must go to become a pastor or wear a collar or go through all the training. And then same thing with the missionaries. But that's not so. The Bible that I read, that you read, you can read, and the New Testament doesn't share that. It says to go out and make all, and make disciples, right? And Jesus says to go out in all the world and to be witnesses for me. So when he's talking about ministering and, and missions, he's talking about everybody who is a follower of Jesus Christ. Not a pastor, not a missionary, but a God of everything. You guys are missionaries. You guys are ministers. 
the moment I serve you, regardless of my title as a pastor, the moment I serve you as believers in this body of Christ, I have become a minister. The same way as Rose has become a minister when she prays for a sister in Christ. The way, same way that, that you go and you run into someone who's a stranger and is, you see is distraught and you say, can I pray for you? And, and then you share the love of Jesus Christ and then the truth, the gospel, you have become a missionary. A missionary. It takes this in a whole different perspective of living with purpose and full of purpose, doesn't it? When you start to think of it that way, I think we can live life in this world differently. And we will be able to discern when we're living in this world, if are we living of the world or are we living in the world? See, I think sometimes when we forget this, so the Latin word mission actually means to send, right? So if we really believe that God created us with purpose and full of purpose and he sent us into this world, then we are missionaries in this world. This world is temporary for us. It really is temporary for us. For those of you who accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and your King, this place is temporary. And you're sent here as missionaries. And so I think sometimes we forget this, that either sometimes we forget or we don't really fully understand or grasp that concept that being sent into this world and, and being a minister or a missionary for, for God, it isn't about doing good because there are a lot of philanthropists out there. I'm going to name one. And I don't know where Oprah Winfrey's faith is. But she's a great philanthropist, right? And if I'm just going to say for argument's sake right now that she is not a believer in Christ. So her doing good does not make her a minister or a missionary. It only makes her a philanthropist. A someone who does good for whatever reason. For whatever reason. See, it's not about just being a good Samaritan. You guys remember the story in the Bible? If you don't know the story in the Bible, Jesus was just pointing out, he did a parable or a story, that there was somebody that was uh, beaten and, and injured on the side of the road, and then there were three people that walked by, and all those three people were priests, and then a, a Pharisee, a Sadducee, and then finally a Samaritan who had nothing to do with the Jews. He's the one that stopped and took care of them. He's the one that gave up his money and paid for his hotel room to get better and his medicine to get better. But all that said, it isn't about being a good Samaritan. Being a minister and being a missionary isn't about doing good because there are folks who don't know Christ that does good that are still part of this world and not in the world being sent. Does that make sense? Because here's the thing. If we don't understand this, who we are in Christ, if we don't know where our bearings are in this world and why we're sent in this world, it's going to be difficult. Listen, it's going to be difficult to live in this world at the fullest that God has intended us to live in this world. At the fullest of this, fulfilling a mission that we're commanded to do, make disciples, and fulfilling an abundant life in what he said, are two great ones, loving God and loving people. And if we don't understand this, what happens is we become the rest of the world with nothing but belief. Because there's other good folks out there that have different beliefs. Is that right? They have different beliefs and they're good people. But that does not make them a member of the kingdom of God. And nor do they have eternal life. Because we all, and I've repeated this before, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gives to the Father except through me. Except through me. So let's go into our scripture this morning, 2 Corinthians 5. You can pull out the same devices that we were trying to uh, do the poll. Next time I'll get a better polling system. That would have been fun. 2 Corinthians 5. 
And as you're getting that, before I read, I'll, I'll give a little real quick summary of uh, Corinthians. And So Paul actually planted this church. He, of all the churches, he probably had uh, a really good relationship with this church. And by the time the 2 Corinthians, this letter, it says 2 Corinthians is actually probably the third letter and not the second letter. So one of the letters was lost in transition. So there's a letter out there missing. But Paul is writing this letter to the Corinthians, and there's a little bit of a strain in his relationship with the church in Corinth now. Um, one, this church has grown. It's, it's big. It is a big, if you want to compare it to a mega church. It, it could be a mega church, or it could be more like our church, the Foursquare Church, that it's just different pockets of believers. So this is a Foursquare Church here, but there's also a Foursquare Church in Uxbridge, and there's a Foursquare Church all the way in California. There's a Foursquare Church in the Philippines. So uh, they're they're all over. So this is Paul writing to them, and there's a couple of things that he's addressing. Well, there's more to talk, but one there's a strained relationship, and one thing he has concern right now is that. He's like, man, you guys have to learn how to be effective in your work as a church in Corinth. Corinth is also a city that's growing. Uh, think of Corinth more like a New York City in that time. Commerce, I mean, it's a big, people are coming all over the world there, and with it is there also their influences. Remember last week we were talking about their influence, how the environment actually influences how you think, how you grow in your behaviors, that is affecting the church in Corinth at this time. And he's saying, look, are you willing to trust God enough to do what you're called to do and focus on God? And, but, you know, he's, it's a harsh letter almost, but it also gives comfort to them. And he brings peace in his word. And he's also encouraging the Corinth church to be one, to be united, right? And here's the emphasis in 2 Corinthians, that they are there and they are to go out with a purpose to restore relationships with God. Now folks, uh, sometimes, I don't know if you've been around believers, I'm not pointing fingers here, but oftentimes Christians are good at pointing fingers at sins and fault and not the restoration. We are called to go out into this world to be reconciled with people and to be reconciled with God. And it's hard to bring restoration into relationships when you're pointing fingers and you're pointing faults. It's hard to bring relationships when you're pointing out stuff, even with this LGBTQ stuff that's going on, this Black, uh, Black Lives Matter that happens. Folks, we're not here to condemn them, but to restore them. To the love of God, the same way. Look, folks, listen, 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 listen. Of all the people, people in general, God could have just <laughs> smite us out. But no. He sent Jesus Christ into this world so that we can have a restored relationship with Him. And you think about it, of who you are and where you are now. That because God loved me. And because he had grace and he had mercy, if all the years that his Israelites have complained, and all the years that the Gentiles who weren't part of them just did their own thing, God said, I love them enough that I will send someone to restore them unto me. Amen. To restore them unto me. So this is Paul's message to the Corinth church, the church in Corinth. And here's what he said. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house we grow, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed while we are in this tent we, we grow being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now, he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. 
Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage. I say, and I prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest also <coughs> in your conscience. We are not again condemning or commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us, so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controlled us, having concluded this, that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might not, no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on our behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no, no one, no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Here's the key passage for today. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Yeah. Yeah. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal to us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin no more on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's some powerful words that he wrote, right? And you think about this newborn. So, in the beginning of the year, how many of you remember the message about, well, opening up into vulnerability? Ah, one. Awesome. Two. Great. Who? I think someone got a January. Awesome. So listen, as a newborn, a newborn is born, and I'm just picturing, I'm sorry, I'm picturing my, my granddaughter now, and you're like, ooh, picture. They're vulnerable. They cannot take care of themselves. They can't clothe themselves. They can't feed themselves. They can't change the diaper. They are vulnerable. They're vulnerable. They're vulnerable to the environments, right? We gotta. We have to cuddle them. We have to wrap them up. We have to change them. We and here's the thing. We have to show them what love is when you brush their cheek, when you give a peck on their cheek, they're vulnerable to knowing and understanding what love is. And thank God for his love and mercy when he brings us new. So I don't know if you guys remember when you first accepted Jesus Christ in your life. Oh my goodness, I, I remember. Other believers coming in, no condemnation, just loving on me. I grew. I, and I grew and I I couldn't, I got to the point where Sunday morning was not enough for me, so I came back Sunday evening, I came Wednesday evening, I came Friday evening, and that wasn't enough, so I was in the men's group, and then I, we had our own home group, and so we were connected to the body of believers every day of the week. A baby, when they're vulnerable, needs to be connected to another human being every day of the the week. Are you getting the picture of this vulnerability? And you think about this newborn into life, right? When we're 
when you first come to know Jesus Christ, this vulnerability of, and there's a lot of hurts you go through, and this is why it's important as already believers in Christ who's been walking with Christ, that you become ministers and not judges. Because a new believer is at that vulnerable state. And as much as, much as you want to point out sin and the things that are going, if you love them so much, they will fall in love with not you, but with Jesus Christ. And they're going to want to be with him more and more. And they're going to be wanting to be with more believers as well. And they're going to want to spend time, not in his church here, but in his church out in the world. <coughs> and what happens is they learn to be reproduced to become ministers and missionaries themselves. Oh, isn't that awesome? See, the, the thing is that with vulnerability as a believer... We get to take an awesome privilege of being able to shape a new believer's life. We can either be part of their lives and teach them how to point out sin and, and be Bible thumpers over the head, or, or we can teach them exactly what Jesus taught his disciples, to love God, to love people, and to make disciples. We can we are purposely and purposefully made to do exactly that. So I'm asking this morning is to allow God to shape you. Allow God to shape you to be more and more what he intended you to be. A minister and a missionary in this world. Not just a people in this world. Paul calls it, he, he, he says it really well, he says, we are ambassadors for Christ, or a representative, right? And so what an ambassador is that one who acts on one's behalf. So if you are an ambassador that is assigned here to this church, this is just an office building per se, where we gather and we meet and we, we praise God and we learn more about him so that when you're out in the field, you're out in the field, you're uh, an ambassador in your neighborhood. You're an ambassador in your school. You're an ambassador in your workplace. You're an ambassador wherever you go. And so how many of you have ever seen a person in uniform out in, in wherever you are? Raise your hand if you've seen a uniform. It doesn't matter if it's military, police, doctor. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. When you see them, you are like, oh, he's in the, oh, he's the, that's what you think of. Now, we don't wear uniforms as Christians, right? But the spirit that you walk by, that you walk in, does, so to speak. So if you're walking, who are you representing? Are you representing the world, or are you representing the kingdom of heaven? So we might not wear this uniform, but the words that come out of your mouth, the actions that you have towards them, and the actions that you have towards one another, pretty much clothes you in what you're wearing. What uniform are you wearing? An ambassador, here's this thing. If you look up ambassador in the dictionary, it tells you, well now this is from actually from the government page, US where White House Gov, whatever that is. An ambassador is the president's highest ranking representative to speak to another nation. Did you know that? Well, I didn't know that. Now think of this. As you are created in God's image, because we just show dogs, right? As we were created in his image, dogs aren't. Cows aren't. Those plants aren't. You are. Therefore, I suggest that if God sent us here in this world, he has sent us as the highest ranking representative for the kingdom of God. Now think about that. If you're the highest ranking representative for the kingdom of God here, are you representing the kingdom of God well? It's a rhetorical question. It's for you to think about. And here's the thing about an ambassador. I don't know if you've ever met an ambassador. I think I've met a couple. But here's what's cool. One of their things, their duties, is that they are called to smooth relations between the country they're from and the country they're in. Listen to that, smooth relations. To me, that means to restore or reconcile. 
You don't see them condemning a country for, okay, this is how we do things in our country, and you guys aren't. No, they are there to smooth <coughs> things out. To smooth things out. And I think for us, it's a crucial aspect for us to understand that when we're created and we're restored to God, it's mutual respect. Think about it. It's a mutual respect that we are all commissioned to share the gospel and make disciples. All of us. Every single one of us in this room. Every single one of us that's meeting at, uh, what's that, St. George Church right over there. And all of us. All of us. And you think about that. That as different as we are, some of us have a strong Boston accent, and some of us has a Southern accent. As different as we are, the words that we are to share are exactly the same. The same. And Paul makes it clear. He makes it very clear that we can't achieve these relationships of restoring and reconciliation on our own. We can't do it with our own skills. And there are some good negotiators, there are some good mediators, but it's at the surface. But to get to the root, to get to this part where we are supposed to be restored onto God, we can't do it on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. God cares. Well, listen to this. Just as an ambassador represents the president and his country, that president cares how his ambassador is in that nation that he sent him to. So God cares how we're representing him in the world that he sent us to. And when I'm hearing that and I'm reading it, I get more excited that, man, look, you look around the room right here. You get to represent God. How awesome is that? You get to represent what it means to love someone. You get to represent what it means to love God. You get to represent what it means to forgive. And you get to represent what it means that even when I'm downtrodden, that I'm still living a life of joy because of Jesus Christ. How awesome is that to represent? We might all be from different walks of life. We all might look different, different sizes. But we sing one note to God. And I want to show you something. So um, I asked our good friend, Clyde, to bring his saxophone in. And I brought my clarinet in, too. Now, we're not playing a song. We're not playing a song. Clyde, we're not playing a song. So these... These, if you think of it this way, okay, these instruments, just like your instruments, were created with purpose. <laughs> created with purpose. This clarinet was created with a purpose to have a different, uh, what's the word for timbre? Uh, tone, quality of a tone, so timbre. The timbre of this is different from the timbre of that. The way this is made, right, is different. So if we both, watch, check this out. Remember I say the same but different? All right, so we're gonna play the same note, E, and you're gonna see how uh, you play your E and I'll play mine. <laughs> Same, does it? It's the same E, but seriously, when this was created, it was created to be flat. <laughs> it was created in the key of B flat. So it has a different tone. It has a different tone. This sounds woody, right? And this has more of a raspy, cool, smooth sound, right? But if he were to play, so he's an E flat instrument, okay, and I would play a fifth down from him because they're, if you guys know circle fifth is musicians in here, they're scales. Yeah. These, these instruments are a fifth away in, in key, okay? 
So if you play, um, uh, play, play your A. Say no. It, he, different, this is it, this is my D, and that was his A. All right. He played an A, and I played a D. Play it. You see how different notes but sound the same. The qualities are different. Here's what's this. This is what's neat. They were purposely made to sound different. Does that make sense? They were purposely sound this pretty, otherwise there'd be nothing but a band of saxophones. But when they created the clarinet, they created with a purpose to have a uh, more woody sound, okay? And this to have more of a brighter, and this is a, this is brighter, so when you listen to music, I'm gonna have you, do you ever listen to, I don't know if people listen to classical music or jazz music. Yeah. Or so big band. When you really listen and you see a saxophone and clarinet, Try to listen for the different timbre. You're gonna, you're gonna find also in classical music that a lot of clarinet, or a lot of music pieces that wanted more of a darker tone and kind of dreary thing would use a clarinet. And for a more brighter, marchy light, they would use the saxophone. So, but what's here is that's purpose. But here's the thing, but the purposefulness of it is that they were both made to be played in a group for music. They were both made to play singly to play music. So they're full of purpose. Their purposefulness is to play music. Their purpose was created to make a certain sound. So Clyde was created to make a certain sound. Well, I was created to make a certain sound, but with full of purpose, we were both created to be ministers on mission. Just this morning. Thank you. And it takes practice. So even with the, the music, with, with Clyde, a musician, uh, and I don't call myself a musician anymore. I don't play with it. Well, Mike and I are, are just joined the Quadrant Community Band recently, so maybe I'll get that in there. But listen, it takes practice. To be a minister, to be a missionary out in this world, wherever you are, takes practice. You just can't go out there. So how do you practice? You read the scriptures. You pray. You talk amongst one another. You get connected with grow groups. You go to Bible studies. It doesn't have to be a Bible study here. I'd love to start one here soon. You go to a Bible study whatever. That is practice. Practice in going out and being in the world rather than in your small world at home to just go out. And I mean this. So like if you're just into video games and you stay home, it is hard to practice what it is to be in the world when you're in your little old world. If you have hobbies that keep you inside all the time and you're just inside all the time, it is impossible to practice to connect with someone, to engage with someone. It is hard to be in practice of being invitational, intentional, so that transformation can happen. Because it won't happen if you seclude yourself in your little old world. And it takes practice to be an ambassador. An ambassador does not stay in his office. If you've ever met one, if you've ever seen one in a the movie, they're always constantly going where? They're going out where this life is happening. Folks, for us to be effective ministers and effective missionaries, we need to be out amongst each other and amongst the world. We do. And here's the cool thing. God wants you to. God trusts you. He does. God believes that he could do it, God. He does. He can believe. Where, whatever age, there is no age limit. Here, here's the coolest thing. So um, the boys and I just recently, Monica, recently started getting into canoe and kayak. And I wanted to know the, the laws and the rules of wearing the life jacket. 
So it's kind of strange here that it, you're between May 15th and September 15th, I think it is, that you have to have it, or you don't have to have it on unless you're 12 and under. But during, after six, September 15th, all the way to May 14th, you have to have it on all the time. So uh, the reason I'm saying it, that there's age, there's time limits, and blah, it isn't just wear it, right? But here's the thing, to be a missionary, to be a ministry, minister to one another and a missionary to the world, there is no age. There's no age. It doesn't say, uh, so at the age of eight, you can become a minister, but you can't be a missionary. No, there's no age. And it doesn't say, okay, at the retirement age of 62, you no longer can be a minister to the church. There is none. And that's so, so wonderful to hear that God has given us the freedom to be ambassadors in this world, wherever you go. If you look at each other, look at each other. He has purposely and purposely made you and created you. He has. Each one of you were created with purpose and full of purpose. Each one of you. God knows each one of you. Every single hair on your head he knows. He knows the exact count. I don't know the exact count on my head anymore because I grew hair. But I could have told you a couple. But here's the thing, because he knows that, he also knows. He also knows if you're neglecting your duties as an ambassador. He also knows if you're neglecting to be ministers to one another or missionaries to the world. And Paul was pretty clear that he says, you're gonna answer for the way you related to people, the relate the way you related to your brothers and sisters and how you relate it to the world. And these are things to think about in checking our bearings. Have we treated our co-workers, bosses, and employees, neighborhood, neighbors, classmates, our church family, church visitors, the driver who cut you off? That happened to me this morning, by the way. And all I did was just honk my horn. Uh, not to mention our family and friends. How have we treated them? How have we responded to them? Were we ambassadors of the kingdom of God or were we ambassadors of the world? God intends his grace. Listen, God intends that his grace, his love, and his mercy, and his forgiveness, and his, his righteousness, and his comforting to transform lives. It transforms lives. It was God's love that transformed you to who you are today. That the old is gone and the new has come. It was not his condemnation. It was not his judgment. It was his love for you, Steve, that transformed your life. And the moment you guys understand that and you go out into the world knowing that you're an ambassador of love, that you're an ambassador of forgiveness, that you're an ambassador for hope, that next person who's struggling is going to know that. And their lives can be transformed as well. No one here too young, too old. No one here is not enough education or too much education. You are all commissioned to be ministers and to be missionaries sent into this world. We are called to be restorers, not, not destroyers. We already have an enemy that wants to do that. Why do we need the, why well, he doesn't need our assistance. He doesn't. We just need to go out there to restore. We do. And here's what, here's what's so cool at the end when, when Paul said that for our sake he made him to be sin who had no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, here's some attributes of righteousness. I mean, there is righteousness. Righteousness. Can you flip the slide to righteousness? Righteousness. It's somewhere. 
There we go, righteousness. There's little words here, you can look, there's a whole bunch. Righteousness. All right, this is just a few of God's attributes of being righteous. So we're made righteous, righteous to God with these virtues. Virtuousness, upright, decency, uh, worthy, worthy, high-mindedness, honor, innocent, blameless, guiltless, sinless. Look at this, saintliness, pure, noble-minded. So these are attributes that we get to share in because of God. And we know that the rest of the world needs this. Because, you know, we are created, again, purposely and purposefully. We are created on purpose, and we are created full of purpose. Each one of you. Each one of you. I don't know about you, but now when I think about being an ambassador, I just, wow. When I go out there, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm no longer just a citizen of the United States that goes out and buys some dog food. I'm going out to dog food, and I am an ambassador for Jesus Christ, going out to buy some dog food. And who knows what happens? So our prayer life should be changing to this, and I. this is our challenge for this week, kind of the homework, is that let's not just pray for the things we need, and let's just not pray like, oh, Lord, what was me, I need you, but let us start praying for our family members who are not saved. Let's start praying for our neighbor who is not saved. Let's start praying for that cashier that you're going to that is not saved. Let's start praying for that person in the workout machine you go to the gym to who is not saved. Let, our, let us start praying as who God intended us to be with purpose and full of purpose in being ministers and missionaries and going out there as ambassadors for the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Let's go out there. Because we're sent into the world, not just to live. But we are sent into the world to live with purpose. And it is a mission that every single one of us is called to do. Because you think about where you are right now. If it weren't for my aunt, if it weren't for my best friend, Eddie, I can't tell you if I would be here with a beautiful wife, six kids, two grandchildren, and being a part of your family. It was because they prayed for me. It was because they didn't thump me with over the heads of the Bible. They loved me. They prayed for me. They lived with me, especially my, my buddy Eddie. And he was a Marine too. We lived life together. We shared. We cried together. We laughed together. We played, played practical jokes on one another, on other people. We lived life together. And it's because someone lived life with me that I became a believer in Christ. But here's the other thing. It's because friends like Glenn and Marge and Yale, who lived life Tim May, who lived life along with me, and I got to serve you at this church. Folks, live with purpose and live with full of purpose. And as we get to, to observe, and I say, can't say celebrate, you can really don't celebrate Memorial Day, you observe Memorial Day. But when you're out there in a picnic, and you, I urge you, whoever company you're with, to pray for them ahead of time, to pray during, to be attuned to what Jesus is going to be telling you about that person, so that you can live with purpose and full of purpose. Each one of you called. And as much as God loves you, He does. He also wants you to be ambassadors for His kingdom. Because if it's not us, then who? If it's not us that shows forgiveness, then who? If it's not us that shows us what unconditional love is, then who? If it's not us that shares a word, then who? If it's not us that prays for someone, then who? And if it's not us that just is a shoulder to cry on, then who? So folks, 
this week, I pray. And I encourage you to live a life for the rest of your lives with purpose and full of purpose as ambassadors for our great God. He chose you. He loves you. Here's the thing. He's equipped you. He has equipped every single one in this room to go out and make disciples. He's equipped every single one of you with special gifts. You might sound different. You might look different. But the moment that you share the gospel, you are playing the same note that the kingdom has called you to play. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. And especially, God, we thank you that you sent your son for us, for us, so that we can be restored unto you. And Lord, we are so grateful and privileged to be able to be called sons and daughters of Christ, of God, brothers and sisters of Christ and with one another. So Lord, we ask that you would not only equip us, but anoint us to go out to be ambassadors for you. Lord, we might not know it all, we might not do it well, but we do know this, that we can keep returning to you and that you would teach us and correct us and still be able to send us out again and do better next time, Lord. So we thank you. I ask you, Lord, that you anoint and bless every single person here, that you would not only touch their hearts, but meet their needs that they, they need for themselves, but also meet the needs that they need to be able to go out in the fullness of their purpose and the fullness of what you made them to be, being sent into this world as ambassadors. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And we thank you, dear Lord, may you bless the souls who died for this country, dear Lord Jesus, and we know the truth that not all of them knew who you were, it's the truth. So Lord, we pray that you can use us ambassadors to even reach soldiers, sailors, and marines alike, and even police and firemen now that are out there, that they would come to know you because they're not, they live a life that's dangerous. A lot more dangerous than what some of us are in your Lord. But my heart breaks for those who put their life on the line who don't know you. Because in a given moment, dear Lord, death means death. But we want them to have life in you. So send us out as ambassadors. Bless us. And let us, dear Lord, let us enjoy one another and enjoy this life that you put us here on earth because of you. And we pray this in your most precious name and all of his people say. Amen. Amen. So go out and be ambassadors for Christ.